Hi, everyone. Welcome to another CAMSign event. Uh, my name is Salman and uh, one of the co-founders alongside Mohammed. Uh, just a disclaimer, Pedram uh, will be joining us later. He's, uh, I think, in his uh, clerkship, so uh, points there. Uh, we're very excited for today. It's a very special event because it's our first uh, clinical cases studies that's being recorded. And another wonderful feature that uh, Dr. Prasad and Dr. Uh, Pendleton have uh, proposed uh, for us is that uh, these will be live uh, microsurgical cases, five of which actually for an hour following a 30 minute Q&A that uh, you'll have live access to cases. And it's a really great idea by uh, University of Saskatchewan. It's a great program with a really wonderful group. And uh, we're really glad that uh, we're collaborating with them. And uh, both of our speakers have pre have presented previously at CAMSign. So, so they are uh, their faces that we've uh, seen before. And uh, the only thing I would like to ask before I pass it on to Mohammed is if you can actually turn your cameras on, if it's possible, so we can keep a dynamic interactive session. It would be appreciated by all of us. Thank you. I'll pass it on to Mohammed. Uh, yeah, hello, everyone. Welcome to our uh, event in camp signing tonight. So I, I'm going to also welcome Dr. Amit Persad and Dr. Uh, Pendleton again to camp sign. As someone mentioned, so we had a pleasure to have both of these uh, dear speakers uh, in summer. Um, in, in other case studies and also in one of the episodes of Women in Neurosurgery. I'm going to introduce the guest for tonight. Um, Dr. Amit Persad is a PGY-5 neurosurgery resident at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, he has an interest in neurosurgical oncology and a skull-based neurosurgery. He has a wide range of research interests, including brain tumor immunology, stroke, and normal pressure hydrocephalus. Amit enjoys wood carving and drawing in his spare time. Welcome back to Kamsan, Dr. Persad. Dr. Nicole Pendleton, uh, Pendleton is a PGY2 neurosurgery resident at the University of Saskatchewan as well. And previous to medical school, she initially trained as a pharmacist and worked as a pharmacist and manager for four years. Nicole is mother to two wonderful children and loves hockey, softball, and is also a bit of a yo-yo master. Currently, her active research involves studying inter intercerebral hemorrhage in mouse models. Dr. Pendleton, welcome back to CAMSign as well. So the stage is all yours. Um, so please uh, feel free to start the presentation. Okay, hey guys. So Nicole and I are gonna, we put together a couple of formal things and then we can go through all sorts of other things uh, if need, if like if wanted and uh, everyone still has an interest and things are going well. So the way we're gonna do this is Nicole is gonna present a case. And if anybody wants to volunteer to answer some questions about the case, then that's fine. If nobody wants to volunteer, that's also okay. And we'll then uh, show the video cases as well and kind of talk through the video cases and how that correlates with uh, the surgical procedure. Okay. Yep. All right, so our first case, um, this is a patient that we treated fairly recently um, loosely based on their, their course in hospital here. So this is a 55 year old female, um, notice progressive insidious hearing loss over the last two years. So it basically not something that you notice like all of a sudden, but if you really question about it, uh, the patient noticed that, oh yeah, maybe she was losing some hearing. Um, she has a past medical history of breast cancer, which was treated with uh, surgery, so lumpectomy followed by chemo chemotherapy and radiation. Um, she was referred actually to ENT for her hearing loss and they found some atypical findings on their examinations and workup, so they ordered an MRI. So um, does anybody uh, feel confident or want to take a crack at kind of just describing what they're seeing in this MRI here? They can be really basic stuff. Um, I feel like this is something that in residency we do a lot. So um, it's, it's good to kind of get uh, the words and the, the, the approach, I guess, to, to trying to um, describe these things. It's always better to do it in a form that's less pressure than more pressure, like in front of staff or things like that. <laughs> I can give it a shot. So uh, I think this is a T2 MRI imaging, I, if I'm not mistaken, because the fluid is white. I'm not sure. I think it's T2. And um, we can appreciate a mass in uh, 
the cerebellar region. It's uh, the white, uh, it's pretty big. Uh, we can see it in the axial and uh, the sagittal cuts um, and the coronal one too, so in all three of them. It seems fixed. Uh, those are all the things that immediately comes to my mind. Really good. That was, that was great. Um, other things that you what, might want to comment on too, that was all, those are all really important things. Other things you notice <clears throat> that it's causing mass effect or encroaching on other important structures. Um, so we could always comment on the structures around. And then if you get other slices of the MRI, you can, uh, you can always think about other things like hydrocephalus, which is something that we always want to think about because it's dangerous, right? So with tumors in this area, good, but that was great. Um, just, just one thing to say, there's, there's six images here. So, uh, this one C is a T2 weighted image. Yeah. A is oh, yes. T1 without contrast. B is T1 with contrast. Uh, and then D, E, and F are all uh, MP rage sequence, which is like a specialized T1 with contrast image. So you rightly pointed out that the fluid is T2 hyper intense on a, uh, uh, like a, on a T2 image, but uh, this one maybe was the one you were talking about C here. The rest of them, this isn't the fluid sequence uh, uh, image. This is actually the tumor itself. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, so this patient was offered surgery. We did um, preoperative diffusion tensor imaging. And curiously enough, we found that the cranial nerves are sort of split into two bundles, which is uncommon with this type of tumor. Typically, we don't see, like we, we saw a cranial nerve five in its normal position, but cranial nerve seven was split into two bundles, one more anteriorly and one more superiorly, which is uncommon for this type of tumor. Normally, it just displaces the nerves in one direction each. So we use that as part of, we use that to plan our operation. So now I'll try and switch the screen share here. Are you guys seeing the video now? Yes, we can. We can't hear the sound though, but we can see the video. Oh, there's not really any sound. The microscope doesn't make a sound and I haven't voiced this over or anything. So I'll just voice it over in real time. So what you're seeing here, this is a, we did a trans-labyrinthine craniotomy. So there's three standard approaches to the cerebellopontine angle. One is retrosigmoidal, one is trans-labyrinthine, and one is middle fossa. They have different strengths and weaknesses. The weakness of a trans-labyrinthine approach is that you go through the auditory structures, and so you will knock out hearing in the patient. But the benefit is that you have a very good view of the, cra of the seventh cranial nerve as you come down along the tumor and have, a, therefore, theoretically a lower chance of injuring it. And the other benefit of it is that you get a great look at the um, intracanalicular portion of the tumor, like within the internal auditory canal. So this is, we started recording after we had had the uh, temporal, like the labyrinth drilled out. This is a retractor. So this is anterior. This is superior. This is inferior. You seeing my mouse too? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. And this is lateral and posterior. So this is the cerebellum that's being shown here, pulled back over top of the tumor. We can follow the video as we go and make comments. So we're burning the capsule of the tumor to devascularize it a little bit to make it more easy to work with. I got better over time at keeping my fingers out of the field. This was a year and a half ago or so. So we're using a knife to open up the tumor. And then this is the ultrasonic aspirator is now being used to internally debulk the tumor. There's many phases to this operation. You can probably see it's like almost a six minute video. So internally debulking it, we start with focus on the top end of the tumor because it's safer, but mobilize it wherever it's easily mobilized. So we came around the corners of it. This is now the bottom end of the tumor, devascularizing it, it was bleeding from there opening it up further because staying within the capsule of the tumor is safe. There's nothing inside of the tumor. All of the nerve structures are along the outside of the tumor. And so we open it up all the way to the sort of most peripheral boundary of the tumor and then continue to use the ultrasonic aspirator to internally debulk the tumor.
This is now the superior polyp tumor dissecting this free. The white structure you can see in the depths there is the trigeminal nerve. So identifying that nervous structure and protecting it is important. You place the patty to protect the nerve and to aid with retraction of the tumor itself. We replace it with a larger patty to help us to continue to isolate and dissect the tumor. We place patties around the other margins of the tumor in order to progressively lift it up. We try to dissect vessels off of the wall of the tumor in order to protect them where possible. I don't know, this is all this. Just in that kind of way. With some burn process. I don't think in this video we've got a great view of uh, the cranial nerves, honestly. There's other videos I can show them that you know, better views. This is continuing. So the principle is to burn and cut any potential vascular structure, and the tumor becomes very scarred in with the surrounding structures. So if we pull and dissect the tumor from the surrounding arachnoid structures. This is back towards the superior pole of the tumor, separating it from the surrounding structures, replacing this patty, lifting the tumor away, and then continuing to dissect it, or sorry, debulk it. You can see the tumor as you debulk it, it becomes easier to mobilize because there's less bulk to it. So we can move it further away from the skull base, mm -hmm. cutting attachments like that in order to further mobilize it. And then continuing to debulk it safely as we go devascularizing the, the capsule. So really it's a process of devascularizing it, mobilizing it, debulking it, and then mobilizing it some more. Because once you're in the tumor and you've identified the capsule of the tumor, you can remain safe by staying within the capsule. I'm cutting it away here from the internal auditory canal. This, this stuff here is the internal auditory canal component. So we're dissecting the tumor bulk away from that. We go to the internal, internal auditory canal last, usually, in our practice. Just a note that while you're okay kind of sacrificing hearing because we know that because of this approach the patient will lose most of their hearing it's really really important to protect the facial nerve just because uh, injury to that is quite easy it's quite a sensitive nerve and also it's quite debilitating for patients post-operatively as well so um that's kind of why they're doing it so carefully around that portion and that's why they got the tensor weighted MRI imaging to, to better delineate how the tumor moved that structure around. So you're always thinking using your anatomy and the knowledge you have with um, common anatomy and then wondering how the pathology has changed that anatomy and then kind of picturing what you should be expecting. Yeah, exactly. This we're now mobilizing the bulk of the tumor. You can see we've really rolled it here and have protected, there were some vessels just now that were underneath it. You see some of those vessels attached to the bottom. So we burn and devascularize this again. And then the microscope didn't have a good recording of removing that bulky part, unfortunately. So we removed that bulky part and now we're moving on to the internal auditory canal component very carefully, as Nicole said, because this is where the seventh nerve lives. And we chose to leave some of it behind because we couldn't safely follow the seventh nerve along this duration. 
and covered the surgical field of surgery. So that's the first operative video. Does anybody have questions or comments? Question maybe. I have a quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. How many hours of surgery was summarized in this six minutes and 24 seconds? Seven hours and 20 minutes. <laughs> All right. Thanks. This is seven hours and 20 minutes of just the microsurgical component too. So it's the ENT part of the exposure was I think about two and a half hours and then closure was another hour after that. So it was like 11 hours of surgery. <laughs> this was a very difficult case. Yeah, the trans labyrinthine approach, you really need your ENT co colleagues because you blow through a lot of bone. Well, they do anyways. <laughs> so they're there most of the morning. Yeah, we, we got a, may I ask a quick question? So here, um, what's your recurrence rate for this sort of the tumors? Hi, like 20%. Like you, you'd quote somebody, honestly, 100% rate of recurrence for a tumor like this because you know you haven't gotten all. This one was also more complicated. I'll, I'll show you in a second. Sure. Really interesting case. Um, so back to the PowerPoint. You guys see the PowerPoint? No, we cannot see that. We, we see your video is still. Oh, wait, I haven't actually clicked share yet. There we go. Now do you see the PowerPoint? Yes, we can we see that now. Yeah. So we got a pretty good surgical result. You can see here. There's an area surrounding the resection cavity of a little bit of like edema and injury, but the patient did overall pretty well. And the interesting thing about this case is the pathology. There's too much going on here to really go through all of it, but this was vestibular schwannoma with, you'll remember this case, all the discussion around it, with a breast cancer metastasis, metastasis uh, into it. So that's part of why it was so difficult is it was a slow growing tumor that displaced all of these components with a fast growing tumor on top of it, infiltrating all of the structure. So really challenging operation. Any questions about that case? Okay, and we'll go on to the next one. Yeah. So uh, this case is around a 66 year old male. So he presented to the emergency department with a thunderclap headache. Um, his past medical history is hypertension. He's on two agents for that. We don't really know what his um, blood pressure was because uh, we just have the records from the emergency department. And when people present to emerge with painful thunderclap headache, their blood pressure is usually pretty high for lots of reasons, but one of them is pain. Um, but he can also be high for other intracranial reasons, obviously that we're concerned about. So um, does anybody have like a top three things they're thinking of when, when they think thunderclap headache? So barachnoid hemorrhage is my first one on the differential. Right. What about as an emergency doctor or like somebody that's not a neurosurgeon? Because if they're calling you, you're probably thinking subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, but other things that it could be that that, that might be presenting as hyperarachnoid hemorrhage. Just two, two more. Some of them can be neurosurgical as well. Could vasculitis cause it? Something systemic? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think um, giant cell temporal arteritis can present like a thunderclap headache. Mm -hmm. That's a really good one. Always but something that you should be seeing. Symptoms too, like there'd be something related there. I guess. Claudication usually is related. Yeah. Um, and then usually you can feel like a palpable cord or a tender spot over the temporal artery. Um, and another thing like pituitary apoplexy can present a thunderclap headache, uh, pecan aneurysm rupture, press. So some neurological things as well. Um, okay. So this is, this patient was doing fairly well besides their headache. Um, and then they got this imaging. So this one's a little bit simpler than the MRI, but it's kind of subtle as well. The, the, the imaging kind of jumps out at you at the MRI, but does anybody 
Can anybody describe two things that they're worried about with this scan? Or one? Start with one. Uh, it looks like maybe the left sylvian fissure is there's some bleeding there. Yeah. Um, it's really good. It's pretty subtle. Is there anything else that you're worried about with this scan? Anytime you think about subarachnoid hemorrhage, you should also be thinking about hydrocephalus. Um, so the, the blood obviously impairs the, the arachnoid granulations resorption of uh, CSF fluid. So um, this patient, <clears throat> the most sensitive spot in the brain to look for um, hydrocephalus is in the temporal horn. So I'll just get the mouse here. So right here and right here. In your average like person under the age of 65-ish, they shouldn't really have any space there. If you think about how a brain is, the temporal, like the temporal structures are very close and everything's very tight. Um, so unless they have like lots of global atrophy and things like that, you wouldn't necessarily expect to see temporal horns. So this patient um, has, you know, mild hydro, mild to moderate, but definitely if they're just presenting soon after this thunderclap headache, you got to be thinking this person probably wouldn't last the night without an EVD for that. Um, and if they were to last the night without an EVD, you'd want to watch them every hour for sure to make sure they're not getting really drowsy. Um, really good. Any question? I think there's a question there. I have a question. Is there yeah. something uh, wrong, like an ischemia with the insular cortex on the right side? I, there's, I'm, I'm not sure if it's just me seeing things that are not there or, hmm. or there's any bleeding near the insular cortex. I, I don't, I, I can't, I don't know if I can track it, but, but I'm curious if that's normal. Because if you look on the, the right side, it looks different from the left side. No? I think it's just like maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think on the right, you're just seeing maybe like a, the, just the way the vessels cut in this one, in this one cut. Yeah. 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 There's, there, there isn't any bleeding on okay. that side in this image. Yeah. And how, do, how could you tell that? It's based on. Just... You, would, you would have to scroll through it, really, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, like the, these two things are what you're seeing maybe yes so the the location of these things are just more in line with the normal course of the mca vessels okay. within the sylvian fissure like the this this is the sylvian fissure here this is kind of the frontal operculum the temporal operculum and then this is the basal cistern so this within the subarachnoid space like a round tubular structure is most commonly uh a, a vessel like this is the basilar here this is the mca on the other side which is distinct from the bleeding within the fissure here it's hard to explain the thought like the, the kind of how you know the distinction between those things but maybe just the well demarcation like you can see the subarachnoid hemorrhage is more diffuse and blends in sort of with the boundaries of the brain okay perfect thank you Really good. So um, anytime you think subarachnoid hemorrhage, you, you want to get vessel imaging, dedicated vessel imaging. Um, a digital subtraction angiogram would be the best, but these patients that tend to come in at like 11, 12, one o'clock in the morning. So um, your next best test is a CTA. Um, most often at, well, at our center, they would probably get CT, uh, CTA kind of back to back once the radiologist realizes they have uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, and then this is what the, the um, CTA shows you. So there's a classic arrow sign on the sagittal view. <laughs> this patient likely had a hemorrhage secondary to aneurysm. And you can see 
on the axial here. This is the M1 vessel. And then the M2 comes sort of, at, it's harder to appreciate on just a single cut of a CTA, but the M2s come off afterwards. And it's a bifurcation aneurysm projecting sort of anteriorly. Probably the most common, or that is the most common location for MCA aneurysms. For MCA aneurysms. For yeah. MCA aneurysms, yeah, is the. What's the most common aneurysm location? Uh, ACOM? Yeah. ACOM's the most common overall. Oh, so this patient was taken to the angio suite maybe the next morning. They probably got an EVD. Um, their aneurysm was coiled. Um, you could argue uh, some centers also will clip MCA aneurysms that are ruptured. Um, in this day and age, unless there's a large associated hematoma um, that you want to debulk because it's causing a lot of um, neurological deficits, most often people are going to get some kind of um, endovascular intervention. And I think, well, I guess speaking for our center, that's because of um, COVID constraints, ICU stays, better outcomes, less invasiveness. Um, yeah, like it's endovascular technology is getting better, but standard of care for an MCA aneurysm rupture would still be clipping. Uh, but our surgeons are sort of beyond normal level of competent with their endovascular techniques. And this is a viable strategy. Like the strategies you could take for an MCA aneurysm rupture would be clipping. Um, you could sit on it, which is a bad strategy, but it is a strategy. Like just wait for it to cool down through the spasm window and then clip it in a delayed fashion or wait for it to cool down and then do a stent assisted coiling so that you can be safe with your antiplatelet agents. Or you can do what was done in this case, which is put coils into it, knowing that it'll probably eventually fail. So this is leading towards a really cool operative video, but okay. this is the coiling that the patient underwent for this aneurysm. So this is the aneurysm here with the coils in it. You can see that even on the initial coiling here, the, the aneurysm is mostly excluded. Uh, in particular, the tip of the aneurysm, which is usually where the bleed comes from, is totally uh, occluded, so the patient's not at risk of re-bleeding, which is really your only goal in a ruptured aneurysm case, honestly. If you have failed to exclude the entire aneurysm, but you have controlled the point of bleeding and the patient is okay, then you have succeeded in your strategy and further management can be undertaken down the line. So that was, that was achieved in this case. I had nothing to do with the coiling. At our center, the endovascular techniques really are uh, like a staff, and we have a cerebrovascular fellow right now, but it's not a usual thing. The, our, our surgeons strongly believe that endovascular training is a extra fellowship and that the focus of the neurosurgery resident should be on open surgery. So a year and a half later, though, it, you, you can see it was already, it already had some residual from the coiling. The aneurysm recanalized, as seen here. So it's, it's again, it's a little bit tough to see on this projection of the aneurysm, but this dark shadow around the coil is recurrent aneurysm. Same thing over here. The dark shadowing around the coil is recurrent aneurysm with blood stasis. And so I'll watch another video. This was a very fun operation. So this is again, I often forget to start videoing until we're into the case a little bit. So we split the superficial sylvian fissure here already. We're working on the deep fissure. We got into a little bit of bleeding, which is why this gel foam is sitting here, obstructing the view a little bit. I told you I got better at holding my hands out of the camera. This case only took place a couple of weeks ago. So we're digging away at the uh, arachnoid and the deep sylvian fissure and the carotid cistern. Got into a little bit of bleeding. We stopped it with just mostly some irrigation. And then that's your first view. I'm going to pause it here. That's your first view of the aneurysm. So this is the, the coil mass sitting in the aneurysm. And we haven't yet exposed any of the vessels really, but it was just kind of cool. <laughs> so we didn't go digging at it because you don't want it to rupture. And you can see the aneurysm is very thin with those coils sitting in there. So we kept working at these arachnoids. And this is a previously hemorrhaged sylvian fissure. So it's very thick and very scarred down. We continued to work at the sylvian arachnoid here, slowly but surely. And then eventually we, we broke through the bottom of it and freed the vessels in the more superficial component of this carotid system. 
And then you'll see like the difference in caliber, like you see all these little vessels around and stuff, but soon the ICA will come into view. It is continuing to free the arachnoid in the southern fissure right now. There's another layer of arachnoid that we again cut through and then spread. I think one of the main principles with aneurysm surgery and what they're trying to do here is to get um, both proximal and then distal control of the, and then go after the aneurysm. So what they're looking for is the proximal vessel so they can um, control the blood flow in case the aneurysm ruptures. Yeah, that's exactly right. If the aneurysm ruptures with your proximal control, so this is the internal carotid artery now, right? And so once we've exposed enough of this, we can then apply a clip across it. So we followed the internal carotid artery up to the M1, which is here, and then continue working away at the distal M1. So this is the M1, this is the M2 bifurcation. And so we're now dissecting the M2 bifurcation free. I don't know what that shadow was, but we're working away at the aneurysm, or at the um, vessels here. We're not yet working at the aneurysm because we don't, well, we have proximal control. We wanna get those other vessels free. So here's the aneurysm neck now. And you can see like the aneurysm has recurred. There's these coils, but there is aneurysm down here that's refilled and is growing over time. So we free all of the vessels because when you clip the aneurysm, you want to make sure the vessels are all still open. I think my video got angry. We'll just skip the part that's black for reasons that are beyond my comprehension. Is it black? That's very upsetting. Hang on. Because the thing is that it's black over the part where we applied the clip. That's too bad. That's no, weird. Like it's showing, like Nicole, you see this, right? Maybe you guys see this too. There's like video on this. Screen, yeah. But it's showing up as black. So that, that's too bad. Um, Anyway, so the clips on the aneurysm here. And these, these cases can be quite difficult because there's very little neck left. And when you pinch the aneurysm off, sometimes it pinches the internal lumen of the M2 branches, like the branch vessels. So we want to make sure that none of those branch vessels are too upset by having the clip. And we weren't convinced of that the first time. So we moved it around actually a few times. So we're trying to be very mindful of all three of those vessels. There's one here, there's one there, and there's one up here. And then there was also a little perforating vessel. You can see it there, just this little pink nub that we were trying to avoid pinching off as well with clipping this aneurysm. Kind of things are you worried about with perforated vessels if you if you catch a perforated vessel. Just like stroke, when people are tired, stroke. Yeah. yeah. So you can see, like we really repositioned a bunch of times, and the key here is that when you reposition it, if it is going to rupture and begins to bleed, you don't want to freak out and remove the clip from the field because then now you're you've got bleeding into a blind field. You just redeploy the clip, and then that stops the aneurysm from bleeding. I think at this point we were happy with the aneurysm clip application because the vessel looked good and. We doppler did. Oh, never mind. We changed it one more time. I thought we changed it three times, but I guess we changed it four times. This was mostly me, to be honest with you. I think that Dr. Kelly was actually okay with the last one. I, I was very convinced that there was something wrong. Um, but then we, we did an ICG run, so you can do like an intraoperative ICG and angiogram and look at the vessels, and you can see the vessels are all good, and here's the clip, and there's no aneurysm beyond the clip. So the aneurysm was totally excluded. This is the ICG overlaid onto the vessels themselves. And you can see there's no bleeding in the aneurysm neck. And these vessels are all filled. So we were satisfied with that. And that was our final result.
That's fascinating. Um, one question I have, um, if you don't mind. Uh, so for MC, MCA aneurysms, I guess like the most, like the approach that would make more, most sense would be like a front to temporal. Is that what, um, like for craniotomy, I guess, um, is that what this uh, was used for this case as well? Yeah, you do a frontal ter temporal or like a terional craniotomy for pretty much every aneurysm, honestly, like um, mm. at least every anterior, anterior circulation aneurysm, even an ACOM aneurysm. Some people would go subfrontal, but really like the, the classic approach would be a terional with like an extended subfrontal component. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, because all of the aneurysms are kind of located in the same little circle at the base of the skull. So the best highway to get to that little circle is through the sylvian fissure and doing like the sylvian fissure laterally is just about there. Mm -hmm. So you do a frontotemporal craniotomy and you have access to that superhighway and you can take it to get down to the vessels and go every which way from there. Right. So interesting. And I guess if, if, if there was a case, um, like let's say like a patient who had like multiple aneurysms like along like um, like one artery or or multiple is is um, like embolization of uh, more preferred uh, rather than coiling or it really depends on the anatomy of the aneurysm so there's a bunch of things but the biggest thing is um, an aneurysm with a wide neck is something that prefers a clip because the coil could slip out of it now there are mm -hmm. endovascular options that allow you to get past a wide neck, like a stent assisted coiling or uh, other devices, a web device is a new thing that mm -hmm. might be good for wide neck aneurysms. But that's kind of the classic challenge for endovascular is having a wide neck and having a clip to put across it is still challenging with a wide neck because sometimes you need a lot of clips, mm -hmm. but it uh, it's more accessible. So if you have, I, like I've done cases with more than one MCA aneurysm where they're wide neck, and we've just gone and clipped all of them. Mm. Uh, oh, wow. But certainly they yeah. do do like pipeline flow diverters where if there's a bunch of ICA aneurysms that are narrow necked and located mm. kind of more proximally and difficult to reach, then you put a pipeline and bypass all of them. Mm. Now we do a lot of endovascular at the center. Our center much prefer, it's not like Vancouver for anyone from there or mm. Vancouver, it's much preferred to clip the aneurysm. In fact, they mm. clip aneurysms that according to current evidence should not be clipped but they're mm -hmm. good at it because they do it so often so they get away with it interesting <laughs> thank you yeah and so this is our ct scan afterwards nice perfect ct scan you can't really see the clip but it's a bunch of metal artifact on <laughs> top of the aneurysm Give the benefit of once you put a bunch of metal in the head, you can no one can ever tell you that it looks wrong. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so here's another case. So this is a really interesting case. Um, it was very recent as well. So we had the 66 year old male. He was being worked up by the orthopedics team for a hip pathology, um, which is I think something that we should get used to checking for when we are doing um, spine clinics. Uh, so you always check, I think it's like pretty basic medical school teaching that you check the joint above and below um, with, the, with the back. It's a little bit different. So you wanna think, um, you, you check the range of motion of the back, the lumbar spine, and then you also check the hip and the knee. Really important. You can catch a lot of pathologies that are actually hip pathologies. Um, or lumbar spine pathologies, vice versa, and then also knee things that present, um, you know, as referred pain up the up the leg, up the femur to the hip. So uh, this guy was being worked up actually by the orthopedic team for this uh, hip pathology. He was complaining of numbness and difficulty walking. His upper um, and using upper and lower extremities. So he is an ex-smoker, long smoking history. Um, the only medication he was taking was Lyrica. He's independent um, at home, otherwise well. So we got an MRI. He was referred urgently um, through the outpatient clinic, which arguably could have been maybe referred to the emergency department, but um, this is what his MRI looked like. 
uh, does anybody know what this is or what they might guess that this, this is or have any experience with spine? It this definitely is looks a harder one. This is a harder one, yeah. But. Yeah, like there's something definitely like along the, um, I believe maybe that's C7 to T1, is it? Um, it's like 6, 7, T1. Yeah. Yeah, 6, it 7. Close. Yeah. Um, and then does it look like, so we can start, but if, if you know, if you don't know, oh, what the pathology is based on like certain factors, then start with what you do know. So it's a sagittal MRI. There's T2 and T1 weighted images. You're looking at the cervical spine. You're looking at the thoracic spine. Um, and then, so it looks like there's a hyper intense T2 lesion, um, intramedullary. So inside the dura and, and also inside the neural elements. Um, so, yeah. so this just, thing is growing inside the spinal cord itself. It's not yeah. like a meningioma in the spine or a schwannoma that's growing off the lining. It's growing from inside the cord. So it's not extra, extra dural. It's not extra medu, uh, intra dural. Action. So just kind of try and describe what you can. Um, and that's, that's always where you start. And then you always try to build on that, I guess. So what she's mentioning, there's three classifications of tumors of the spine. One is extra dural. So extra dural includes osseous tumors of the spine, like hemangioma or osteosarcoma. Uh, the second classification is intradural extramedullary. So that's of the lining, the dura, or really the arachnoid elements too, like intradural, but outside of the spinal cord. So meningioma, schwannoma, neurofibroma, those are your classic uh, examples of uh, intradural extramedullary spinal cord tumor. And intramedullary spinal cord tumors are the rarest of those, uh, the, of the like three classifications. And these ones are typically representing one of three major pathologies, uh, ependymoma, astrocytoma, and hemangioblastoma. And Astrocytoma can come with pilocytic astrocytoma too, uh, but usually it's diffuse astrocytoma. So characteristics of this one, it's T2 hyperintense, it's cystic. So anything with a T2 hyperintensity tends to have fluid inside of it. There's T2 hypointense caps to it. And if you look at it on contrast imaging, it's ring enhancing with avid enhancement around the cap on the bottom but not at the top and an internal septation. So it's something that's growing probably not too fast, but has a degree of enhancement to it around the outside. It's an interesting sort of tumor. So this is actually the end. I, I, I didn't do much of like the formal PowerPoint, but I'm gonna bring up the video now. Hang on, there we go. Quick. Okay, you guys see my quick time player? Yes, we can see that, yeah. Okay, so this is, we're just focusing in here. We just removed the lamina. We're cleaning up over top of the spinal dura. I'll still be able to bring you through this, but it's just gonna be a tiny bit less smooth. Mm -hmm. Oh, did it stop sharing? Yeah, I think maybe stop sharing. Okay. Oh, yeah, there we go. Do that again. Yeah. Okay. Good. So we're now clearing this up, putting patties to control epidural hemostasis over the cord. This is always exciting to me, like spinal cord, like spine is less cool than brain to me, but spinal cord is sort of just as cool, if not more cool. So we got ourselves ready. We sort of pulled this plot off. I'll leave this here. That's the knife coming in. So we opened the spinal dura and then introduced a dissector. That's some CSF squirting from the arachnoid. We opened the dura using the dissector as an assisting instrument. And then the, pass up the dura. Oh, sorry. The, the, um, I, I'm not sure if anyone else is getting this, but I, I, it looks like the video is uh, frozen for me. Oh. You're seeing it here? We can see your mouse, but the video is, is frozen. Oh. 
Huh. Okay, let me try and let me unshare and then share again. Let mm -hmm. me tell you spectacular. <laughs> okay. Are you seeing now? Yes. 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 Perfect. Perfect. All right. So back to here. So we clean this up and we open with the knife over top of the cord. This is always a little bit of a fumbly process because the dura can be variable thickness. Mm -hmm. But then once you get through, we introduce a dissector. We tried this stupid move that I hate, but Corny wanted me to try it, where we pull the dura apart, and it usually doesn't work in any sort of case, or well, just in general. I tried it and it didn't work, so we did <laughs> the way that I like to do it, which is with the dissector, and then cutting on top of the dissector to open the dura. Pretty cool. We just like drag the knife and the dissector together. And that'll allow you to open the door. And then we put tack up sutures. We found the midline of the cord, the, dorf, the dorsal wrap, and so we then cauterized over top of that. There's still some arachnoid in the way, because we sort of did this very peripheral arachnoid dissection, but we made this cauterization. And then we opened it with the knife. We put in these tack up sutures. These little sutures are peel tack up sutures with 6 of proline to help us show us the plane. You can see the inside, there's this abnormal looking tissue, and then there's this white matter. So, this is just putting the pack up and then that's dissecting the plane. Oh no. And you're spinning beach ball with jack on my screen. That's not a good. And so we managed to get this freed all the way around and swept it carefully off of the surface of the normal cord. And we're able to remove it. You can see the normal plus hidden spinal cord there. Just one question. Um, did it, I guess, because it's as tumor tissue, like did it, what is, is it um, like hard in consistency or did you find that it was kind of like almost like peeling off easily um, as, as you were removing the tumor? Uh, it was both. It was peeling off easily. It was hard and calcified at the edges, like at those caps where it was very stuck. Uh, the rest of it was quite rubbery, but it had a nice plane with the spinal cord, which is why we're able to remove it like that. Astrocytoma, mm -hmm. on the other hand, like uh, diffuse astrocytoma, doesn't really come with a plane, so you can't really resect it like that. Mm -hmm. This one, the pathologist thought this might have been pilocytic astrocytoma, which comes with the cyst mm -hmm. and a module as well. So it fit with the caps and the cystic structure in the middle. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thank you. No problem. I was kind of planning to adventure you guys through some more of my videos, but my computer seems to not like it in terms of the memory demands. So it might be best. It's actually starting to really slow down. I'm not sure why, but it might be best to not go further than that. But I hope that you guys enjoyed what you saw so far. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. No problem. Does anybody have any questions? I see. Oh, I see lots of clapping hands as well. <laughs> well, guys, thanks for inviting us tonight for some microsurgical kind of cases. And um, 
neurosurgery is really diverse. So there's the microsurgery aspects, there's the bang up kind of spine kind of days, and then <laughs> other other types of days as well. So um, definitely a field where you can choose what you love and and kind of pursue things uh, uh, how you how you want to shape your career. So, so anybody ever has any questions, they can just let us know. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, both uh, Dr. Prasada and Dr. Pendleton for showing those videos. I think um, talking about like the cases is one thing, but also like looking at the anatomy, appreciating the, the structures and also uh, seeing like the, um, the, like the management of the, the surgical management of the patient, like in, even in video is, is, is super fascinating for me. And I'm sure everyone in the and the call will agree as well. Um, uh, we wanted to uh, maybe get your um, uh, uh, say a little bit about uh, this program of Saskatchewan. I think Dr. Prasad had some uh, um, things in mind regarding that. Uh, yeah, so it, I, I don't know if I made it totally clear. There's more videos that I could show you, but all of these videos in the hard drive that I have at least are like Pendleton and I wanted to present this together so that you guys would get a nice showing from our university. Uh, but uh, like these are all resident cases. Uh, all of these cases, the main surgeon you saw operating was me, not one of mm -hmm. our faculty. And oftentimes the assistant was somebody else like Nicole over here or uh, one of our other residents. So this is a, it's a good program to get your hands on surgical skills, but not just like laminectomies and burr holes, we're doing some pretty complex microsurgery over here and we maybe are more sort of likely as residents to be doing the operation, I think, than other centers, uh, just based on our discussions. Like that week that I clipped the aneurysm with the previous coiling, I think I actually clipped like four aneurysms in 10 days or something that week, something <laughs> stupid like that. And then at the end of the week, we did this uh, intermedullary spinal cord tumor. There's been some good cases recently. <laughs> And actually the faculty really kind of gear it to education. Like the intramedullary spinal cord tumor was planned during our half day. And the faculty who was doing it, uh, like scheduled it to be in the afternoon so that the half day would be over. And so that I could come and do the operation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's actually really, really interesting. And um, also I wanted to I wanted to mention that if, if uh, I'm sorry that, um, you're not able to share those uh, videos that you had in mind, like the, uh, the rest of the videos, but if there's anything that you'd like us to share uh, with CAMSON, we'd be more than happy to uh, more specifically about the program, um, the residency program in Saskatchewan and try to um, uh, get some uh, uh, folks uh, seeing those videos. And I, 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 at least I'm glad that this session is being recorded so that uh, others who weren't able to make it today, they can, they can watch it at home. So, yeah. Can I, can I ask a question if you don't mind? Uh, so you mentioned that you have led uh, all these like neurosurgeries by yourself and you're PG by five. So my, my question is that at what level of your education you are uh, you're allowed or you are able to just lead a neurosurgery by yourself, maybe with the help of the other other residents, but you are the, the, the lead of the of the operation. So the first case I showed you that Schwanoma, that was at the end of my PGY three year actually. These are like cases throughout my residency. Wow. So, mm. so is, it, is it because you're, you're exceptional? Because we know that you're exceptional. But is it a routine <laughs> of that? Or, or yeah, at the yeah. end of the PGY3, we should be able to do that as well. Ask Nicole sitting right here. She's led brain tumor operations as a PGY2. And... Yeah. Wow. yeah. This was the first year where I got to be like, uh, like the staff is in, always in the room, obviously, when I'm there. But, um, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, like I will be often like the, the primary one on a, on a tumor like met metastatic tumors, like not usually like the big beasts that are kind of by the brainstem yet, but <laughs> getting there. So <laughs> that, that takes a while though. Yeah. So, but still like uh, what she just said is that she's often performing. So in our program, sort of, as soon as you gain the requisite microsurgical skills to survive in the OR, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the assumption is that you will do as much of the operation as you're capable of. So if you're, if you're, good and you show up and you practice then generally you're capable of quite a lot even by pgy2 because of just how much work is in neurosurgery residency mm -hmm. so for nicole she's 
like she's in PGY two, and it's a uh, it's mm. um, it's March tomorrow, but she actually has been off service mm. for most of the year, so she's only been back for January and February. Oh wow! It means that this is like her second year of doing neuro, uh, second month of doing neurosurgery as a PGY two, and she's leading wow. the tumor wow. metastasis <laughs> operations. So it's a uh, it's pretty routine in our program actually. Like uh, our PGY three resident in the CARMS last year liked to talk constantly about how she was like a uh, performing the main portion of an operation for like a newborn kid with an endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Mm -hmm. I did my first carotid endarterectomy as a second year resident. Um, mm -hmm. The like our PGY1 Braden Newton. He's still he's still PGY1s don't necessarily do so much in our program like you still you under supervision you might get to do some skills but you're not leading much as a PGY1 but you know he's mm -hmm. doing like skin to skin shunt operations and that sort of thing like it's better wow. than I still think most programs are at this stage. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Sorry, guys, I gotta run. I'm I'm on call tonight, but um. Oh, uh, thanks no, thank you so much, Dr. Pendleton. It was a yeah. great yeah, presentation. No worries. Thank you so much for coming. Really yeah. appreciate it. Absolutely. Just yeah. super quickly, because I know probably I'm also tired. There's an event that's happening. It's technically one of CampSign's advisory board members, the Professor Del Maestro. It's a very interesting topic. It's Leonardo da Vinci and the search for the soul. So if any of you are interested, I just put the link over there. It's 6 p.m. Eastern time. It's uh, with the McGill and Western Rosler Society. Anyone's welcome to join. Okay, I'll pass it to Pedro to close. No worries. Um, Dr. Prasad, I wanted to just thank you again and Dr. Pendleton as well for joining us, rejoining us actually back in camp sign and um, sharing these fantastic cases. Uh, I'm sorry uh, that uh, you had some troubles on the end, uh, on your end to uh, share all the videos, but I think uh, it certainly was enough to fascinate all of us. Uh, and we're uh, more than happy to share if um, any other videos that you'd like to uh, 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 to share with us with uh, the camp sign group and uh yeah and uh we hope that um we'll, we can invite you again for future talk or future cases uh as we'd love to see more and learn from you um and i want to also thank the audience for coming tonight uh we really appreciate you being here and uh being keen on uh doing some virtual neurosurgery uh, shadowing um and um and we hope to see you actually in our next event, which is coming up on March 17th um, with Dr. Jason Karim Chandani from McGill. He's a, a professor of neuropathology. And we're really, really excited because now uh, this is the first event where we are uh, basically bringing in uh, these neighboring specialties that are very you know, close to neurosurgery and very important to, to learn about. Um, and so starting with neuropathology is one thing that uh, we're bringing um, up for you guys. And we hope to see you there. And hopefully in, uh, in a week or so, we'll have that information ready um, so that you can register for that. So, yeah. So um, I'm not sure if someone and Mohammed have anything else to say. Uh, Perfect. But uh, yeah, thank you again so much, everyone. And I hope everyone enjoys your, uh, their evening. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Good evening. Thanks thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.